Welcome back. Yes. Well, uh, I would like to welcome all of you who are attending uh, this event um, on biomass and bioenergy and the way in which uh, it uh, can play a role in mitigation of uh, climate effects. Um, I would like to begin by thanking particularly Chiara Domestici and the a communications team at Vault who've been very helpful in setting this up and are going to be running the event. And then I'd like to thank our two speakers this evening, Jean-Marc Jossard and John Shepard, 
and I will go on to introduce them now and myself. Um, Jean-Marc uh, qualified as an agricultural engineer from the University of Louvain in 1989 and started his career almost immediately in the bioenergy sector for which he has a, a real passion. He is now the Secretary General of Bioenergy Europe, which is a non-profit Brussels-based international trade organization that brings together 41 associations and 122 companies as well as academia and research institutes from across Europe. Jean-Marc has wide experience in expertise in many bioenergy aspects, including technologies, markets, policies, economics, certification, and sustainability. So we're very fortunate to have him here to introduce this uh, subject. Professor John Shepherd is a fellow of the Royal Society in the UK. He is an emeritus professor and the former director of the National Oceanographic Center at Southampton, where he was a professor. Um, he's worked on a wide range of environment related topics, including the transport of chemical tracers in the atmospheric boundary layer and in the deep ocean, uh, the management of fish stocks and the dynamics of the earth system. In fact, um, I've known John mainly from his work on, on uh, uh, fisheries and marine science, where we worked together for a number of years. Um, he led a comprehensive review of geoengineering, climate geoengineering for the Royal Society and co-authored uh, papers by the uh, European Association of Science um, on science and policy, policy in, in forest bioenergy. So that is uh, really the, the basis of his uh, uh, contribution uh, on this topic. My own uh, uh, background is that I'm uh, an emeritus researcher now at the uh, Danish Technical University. Um, I spent many years working in Copenhagen um, at an international organization, uh, the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, on impacts of climate change on fisheries and marine ecosystems. I have been involved with uh, IPCC uh, activities, IPCC reports um, since the mid 1990s, both as a uh, lead author and as a reviewer of uh, the, those reports. I'm a member of VOLT, I'm, I'm wearing the, the, the badges and <laughs> Uh, I work on VOLT policies in relation to climate and biodiversity, particularly in relation to the European Green Deal. Uh, I organized uh, uh, a meeting similar to this one, VOLT Meets the Experts Online, last year, which dealt with uh, tipping points in the climate and biodiversity systems. And as with this um, event, it is still online uh, on, on our YouTube channel, so you can visit it at any time uh, later on. It will, this event will remain on there for a while. And uh, you can also comment uh, on that uh, uh, YouTube channel. And we will try to look at the comments from time to time and uh, possibly provide responses as well. Well, the event this evening, the title um, of the event is What is the Impact of biomass and bioenergy on climate mitigation. Having taken part in, in a number of uh, debates and discussions about climate over the years, a question that, that used to be asked very frequently, but less so now was, how long do we have? How long do we have before the effects of climate change are evident and before we need to act? I think people are asking this question less frequently nowadays because I think the answer is becoming increasingly obvious. We need to act now. In fact, I would say that we are already in the early stages of a climate and biodiversity catastrophe. But um, when we think of a catastrophe, we think of something that happens suddenly and very fast. And this is a very slow catastrophe. But nevertheless, um, 
the way that things are changing, the, the speed at which many things are changing in the Earth system um, is extremely uh, concerning. It's quite clear that already people, enterprises, industries, politicians are all responding uh, to this. And in Europe, the European Green Deal is the principal vehicle uh, for this response. It's the uh, principal uh, way in which uh, politically people are trying to uh, cope with the situation and uh, by, by formulating uh, regulations, directives and new ways of, of acting. I think um, if we look at the Fit for 55 package, which was a set of regulations and uh, launched uh, on the 14th of July this year, they include regulatory and financial actions, and they will be debated, uh, fought over and agreed over the next year or two. This, I think, is where Volt, as a small but growing political party, can think of how we can intervene, both by informing ourselves and the public about what is happening, and also uh, campaigning for effective action by all sectors, civic sectors, business, industry, and government, in order to tackle um, the crisis that it, uh, affects not only our climate, but also our way of life, our, our ecosystems, our biodiversity, and our health. I think there are two aspects that I could uh, perhaps bring out at this stage. One is that if you look at what's happening, it's pretty slow. Politically, the actions are, are quite slow. In Denmark, uh, in uh, today's newspapers, we're talking about the policies announced by the government, which they said were very good. But um, if you look at the actual action, it's all being put off until after the next general election. So there are statements about what we ought to do, but the, the, the time scale has been put off until it's politically easier to deal with it. Um, now, uh, that is that I think is not uncommon, but but in fact, what we also see within the European Green Deal is a ratchet process where it's accepted that, that initially actions will be quite gradual, but the idea is that they will be ratcheted up so that we pick up speed in order to um, act effectively. The second component that I would point out, and again, taking the Danish example, but there are examples in other countries, is that Denmark has set up a um, Danish climate council, which is a group of experts appointed by the government to review progress annually and to comment on how well we are doing and where we need to do better. And I think that in conjunction with the ratchet can be a very effective way of reviewing and improving our progress. In a complex area like this, it's extremely difficult to come up with effective policies right from the beginning. And therefore you have to learn by experience and uh, adapt as you go along. The aims that I think we all share are to rapidly reduce our climate impacts. And that is under the general heading of mitigation, which is what this event is mainly about. The second is that we need to adapt to the changes that are already happening and that are unavoidable in the future. And we need to do both of these things, mitigation and adaptation, in a way that is equitable, both in relation to our own uh, uh, populations, but also globally, and in a way that does not harm biodiversity and health. We, we cannot achieve uh, those aims uh, of mitigation and adaptation uh, unless we all work together, unless uh, all sectors of society um, support them, even if this means putting uh, their own uh, self-interest um, after the, the, the greater good that's required in order to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Transforming our energy systems is a key part of climate mitigation. And, and to achieve um, that transformation, the first thing that we need to do is to reduce our energy consumption. And the second thing that we need to do is to reduce the carbon intensity of energy production and distribution. In other words, yes, we do need to continue to produce energy, electricity, heat, and so on, 
but in a way that is less uh, carbon intense. Biomass plays a key role in both sequestering carbon, that's what plants do all the time, and also in producing low carbon energy. But it is by no means the magic bullet to stop the unfolding catastrophe. And there are very good reasons for looking carefully at the way in which uh, biomass is used uh, as a mitigation tool. Uh, for one thing, uh, the carbon accounting methods, uh, we have to ask whether they're correctly and fully, whether they correctly and fully represent the balance sheet of carbon taken from and released into the atmosphere. Secondly, we need to look at the impacts that um, uh, biomass and bioenergy have, on, particularly on forests and biodiversity, but other aspects of land use as well. Thirdly, we need to look at the impacts um, of uh, burning biomass on health. And just a reminder that even now, air pollution, not of course all produced by biomass, um, kills more people than the corona uh, epidemic. Um, and fourthly, um, there is the issue of carbon capture and storage, which I'm not sure that we will have time to deal with, but it's quite a key part of the way in which um, the contribution of uh, biomass to, to climate mitigation may be enhanced. So um, I think I probably said enough there. I, I just want to end up with a quote from a, a US senator. Um, this is a, a Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, who said, the best place to start is ensuring that big tech trade associations are powerful advocates for ambitious climate action. And we are very privileged to have the uh, Secretary General of one of the big trade associations with us this evening. And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Jean-Marc uh, Jossard to give his uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Keith, um, for this uh, introduction, setting the scene. Very nice words. And uh, bioenergy is certainly not uh, a silver bullet to, to, to solve the, um, the enormous challenge we have uh, in front of us. Um, but let me a bit, I was asked to, to cover three points, uh, how bioenergy um, is part of the energy transition, um, how does it impact climate uh, mitigation and uh, what is the impact on the on the land use so it's <laughs> quite a program uh, and I will try to do it in uh, a few minutes maybe, maybe a quarter or so so for the moment Banerjee covers roughly 10%, a bit more than 10% of the final energy consumption uh, in Europe, which is very significant in fact. 96%, huh? um, uh, I will come with some numbers <laughs> during my presentation. So 96% of the biomass comes from Europe. In reality, we are the, the first indigenous um, energy source in Europe. We are producing more biomass in Europe than coal, more biomass than gas, more biomass than oil. All these fossil fuels are largely imported, more than 90% of the oil is imported. Uh, it's, just, it's not a, a secret, um, but for biomass only a very 4% uh, is imported. So how do we use this biomass? There are three main sectors. So the, the, the heat sector first is the main one. Uh, so we are heating buildings. This is the first biomass market with individual stoves, individual boilers or district heating. And, and you know about this because Copenhagen, a large part of Copenhagen is heated with a district heating uh, using uh, biomass as well. Um, this includes also in this building, the public buildings, the services, uh, and so on. In a heat uh, market, we also have industries. Um, they are using not low temperature heat typically, but they are using uh, steam and mainly the woodworking industries are using biomass because just they have wood available. So it means 
The pulp and paper industry is producing uh, their own steam with biomass. The, the, um, the sawmill industry, uh, they have to, to dry the, 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 um, the sawn wood uh, and they use mainly, uh, mainly wood. Um, and the, the, even the panel industry is using also biomass as, a, as an energy source. Uh, in fact, in this, in the heat sector, biomass, again, bioenergy is the main renewable energy. It's 85% of renewables in the heat sector is, is biomass. And the heat sector is really tremendous. Eh? It's a tremendous market. It's more than half of the final, final energy consumption in Europe. So we, we absolutely need to address this. Um, with different, uh, by different means, uh, also energy efficiency, of course, first, uh, but then renewables for the, for the rest. Second market for, for bioenergy is electricity, um, where we are far behind um, hydropower, for example, far behind uh, wind power, uh, far behind uh, PV. Uh, but still, we have um, some biopower production, which is mainly coming from CHP plants. Uh, more than 70% of the bioelectricity comes from CHP plants. And again, we have a nice example close to you uh, with the Copenhagen uh, district heating system, which is in fact a CHP, uh, a CHP plant that producing it means uh, heat and uh, electricity. And the third market for bioenergy is transport. Um, there we only cover roughly a bit more than 5% of the total fuels uh, used in transport, uh, which is mainly uh, driven by, by fossil fuels, as, as you know, but we are still producing some uh, ethanol and biodiesel up to um, a bit more than 5%. So all these markets for final energy are, are fueled with either solid, gaseous, or, or liquid fuels. It means that bioenergy is quite versatile in terms of the, the type of fuel and the type of um, processes and the type of end use. This is definitely um, a fuel that is more... more yeah, more versatile, more flexible than any other uh, renewable energy source. Um, and all these fuels are coming for the moment mainly from forest. 70% comes from forest, 20% uh, comes from agriculture, and 10% from, uh, from waste. This fairly large, very large market uh, is uh, creating jobs, more than 700,000 jobs. So bioenergy alone creates more jobs than all other renewables together. Why? Because, because especially we need the fuel procurement that, that all other renewables energy do not have to care of. They, they, if the sun is, is coming, um, the, the wind, you don't need, you don't need manpower to, for this, but to, to collect, um, to treat the biomass, transport it, um, and so on, you need, you need jobs on top of the manufacturing, the equipment, maintenance, the equipment. So that's why it's, it's a really intensive um, renewable energy source in terms of, uh, of jobs. Um, and me, it means also many companies. We have listed um, something like 50, over 50,000 companies 50,000 yeah, companies uh, in Europe. Many are small SMEs, some are large ones. Um, but if it is nice also to, to, to consider that Europe is really number one in terms of technology for bioenergy. So, so again, a difference compared to other, some other renewables where, where Chinese companies are leading, in our case, European companies are exporting their technology. So three roughly, roughly three quarters of the technology providers uh, are based in Europe. And we are exporting our European companies. They have offices in China, um, in the US, and we, we are exporting uh, a lot of our technologies. So this is the situation uh, now. Um, in the future, um, this will evolve with uh, innovation. 
Uh, for example, the East markets, I can mention a few examples of this. For example, in the, in the heat sector, uh, in the future, progressively, the, the, the capacities and the, the appliances needs to be um, renovated. Uh, because some, some, um, some biomass appliances are old um, with low efficiency, with uh, some emissions of particles, and you mentioned it for, for air pollution, this is an issue. So we really need programs to, to, um, to renovate, to replace these old appliances uh, with more efficient um, biomass uh, units uh, with lower emissions, um, and, and together with the insulation of houses. So it means that it's not necessarily a huge increase of the quantity of biomass, but in reality, if I may say so, we can we can heat much more buildings with the same amount of biomass, just because the 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 the, the, the units will be more efficient uh, than uh, in the past. In the electricity sector. Um, for sure, the wind and PV power will continue their strong increase. They have two digit growth rate for the moment, and this will last hopefully for uh, the years to come. The main problem for uh, these renewables is the intermittency. So their biomass will could play a role uh, because this will be cheaper definitely than hydrogen, cheaper than batteries, and again, uh, I like the Copenhagen example, but um, but uh, this is what um, the, the main utility in Denmark is doing, compensating because they also have wind uh, installed wind uh, energy, and they have they are compensating um, the intermittency of wind energy with biomass when simply when there is no uh, there is no wind. Transport is the big challenge because we have only something like 7% uh, renewables now, mainly biofuels, but still there's a huge consumption increasing. Uh, really, honestly, I don't know how to decarbonize this sector. Huh? There's no silver bullet. Uh, the, um, the company is also producing biofuels um, uh, are now uh, reluctant to, to to invest uh, much more money because the, the legislation changed. You know that uh, biofuels um, and the perception of biofuels is so bad <laughs> and the legislation changed so much so that, uh, you know, it's a kind of risky business for them. Huh? Uh, so are we going to really see a lot of biofuels in the plane sector, in the, in the trucks, I'm not sure about this. Uh, so, decarbonizing heat, possible, possibly, fine. We, we will do it. Electricity, we can do it. Transport, good luck. So, this is um, for, for a kind of uh, rough idea of, uh, of the biomass, but you know, it's, it's a complicated sector. Regarding the Climate impact. To go to the second, uh, the second point of this uh, short presentation, I see three points uh, to mention. First, uh, is the role of bioenergy um, in terms of carbon stock, because the the um, bioenergy is closely linked to the way we manage forests. And um, I think we can continue the, the pace that we had for the last dozens of years. In other words, increasing the carbon stock of the forest. The, the forest stock is, is, is increasing very much in Europe. Um, and, uh, and we should continue to, to, to have a certain carbon sink, as we, as we call it. Um, together with the carbon stock in the materials, uh, because a wood house can store carbon for something like 100, 150 years. Um, 
and and, and definitely this is a, a, a good way. Um, the second aspect is the carbon substitution. Uh, indeed, if we um, build, uh, I hope we will build much more houses in, in, in woods, it means that the woods sector should possibly increase. Uh, it is the kind of uh, the wood sector that includes the biofinery uh, bio, biofinery concept. So it's not just wood houses. In fact, these are biocomposites. These are these are textiles. These are uh, the, the, there are numerous products that can be done with uh, with with wood fibers, uh, because in, in reality, this is the only renewable carbon that we have. I mean, uh, with wind, we have electricity, but with electricity, you, you, you don't have any material. So, so if you, we need materials, huh? we, need, uh, um, we need to substitute the fossil products like plastics and, and, and the rest and concrete and steel with, with renewable carbon. And the only way is, is, is biomass. And there's no, <laughs> there's no multiple options. Huh? Uh, and, the substitution is also valid for energy, of course. It's not only the substitution of concrete or steel, uh, it's also the substitution of fossil fuels, which are the main, uh, the main source of emissions uh, increasing the CO2 in the atmosphere. And the third aspect, you mentioned it before, is the, um, is the negative emissions. Uh, it means that uh, on top of the, the, the carbon sink in the forest, we can go for also hopefully more secured uh, negative emissions. Um, in the short term, some, um, some alternatives like biochar uh, are, are already technically possible. It's proven that it works. Um, and later on, don't ask me when, but <laughs> the, the, the carbon sequestration and storage um, could could uh, be an option, um, and and this is at the pilot level now, uh, including in in Denmark as well. By the way, so in the future we could imagine, in fact, the combination of all these things, where wood will, if I take an example, wood could be used in uh, for buildings. At some point, these buildings needs to be. Um, renovated and, and, and refurbished and whatever. So this wood uh, can be used uh, for energy. Yeah? The waste wood can be can go for, for, for energy production. And, and in this energy plant, the same CO2 could, could be sequestered, could be captured and sequestered. So you see in a kind of cascading procedure, we have saved the product, we have saved energy, and we have um, captured this CO2. So this is a kind of virtuous cycle. Uh, and, and, and there's no doubt that the carbon balance uh, will be extremely positive in that kind of, um, of, of chain and use of, um, of wood. Going to the third point, which is land use. Um, there, it's um, we we need to yeah. Bioenergy, as I mentioned, is um, covers a lot of different pathways, um, um, including uh, agriculture, the, the use of some agricultural land, forestry lands, um, and also on top of these two types of land, the the, the um, even the kind of Urban land. Eh? The, the, in fact, I'm, I have in mind the maintenance of the of the of the gardens and the, the, the trees along the streets and uh, and so on, which is which is not a big share of biomass, but still uh, important. We have to maintain this, uh, the, this this biomass as well. So the the impact on the land use differs on the kinds of biomass. Uh, um, if this comes from agriculture, you have some um, some energy crops for biofuels. They are part of it. Roughly half of these crops are used for biofuels. Um, the rest goes to the feed industry. Um, so it it use a significant uh, share of land in Europe uh, and and outside Europe. 
and this is regulated now. I don't have the time to 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 explain you the the idle concept and and all these things. For farmers, this is a bit this is strongly different because we don't never grow forest for bioenergy. This this doesn't happen. It, it's uh, because simply for economic reasons, the forest owners will not will not buy some lands, plant trees, maintain trees for, for some dozens of years um, to, 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 to sell the trees at a low cost for energy. So those that are saying that uh, is just simply not true. So it's a question of using residues, not only from the forest, but mainly residues from the woodworking industries, which is the main, uh, the, the bulk of the, of the wood, share of biomass. So the impact on land use is minimal uh, in, in the forest sector. Uh, we speak about energy crops, whether it is agriculture or forest is another story, but um, some models are planning an increase of energy crops. Honestly, uh, this is, um, this is uh, for the moment, at least not likely to happen um, at, uh, at a large scale, certainly not. Um, yeah, I, I could mention uh, something else, but I will wait for the question <laughs> to be too long. But I will still um, uh, end this presentation with uh, the, um, for this climate impact and land use impact, it's really important to, to have in mind that now the legislation for bioenergy is really um, innovative in a sense that this is the only sector that has mandatory systemic criteria. In the in the by law in the directive, no, the food sector doesn't have that, and the, the 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 palm oil sector for food doesn't have any criteria. The the, the chocolate sector and the deforestation in Africa doesn't have any mandatory criteria like the one for uh, biomass. So if you use biomass for um, other electricity, heat, or transport. Uh, you have criteria wherever this biomass is produced in the world. So this is really something that is that is really paving the way for a legislation that will hopefully cover all kinds of use of the biomass um, in in Europe and hopefully uh, in third countries. Um, because at the end, this is these are criteria for land use. Um, and also CO2 uh, emission savings, even if, if maybe uh, you, you mentioned the, the, methodologies of, the methodology for the calculation might not be perfect, uh, I can hear that, but, uh, but at least this is, uh, we have to admit that this is really a first courageous step of the European um, institutions uh, in the right direction and setting sustainability criteria for our, our consumption. Uh, I will uh, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jean-Marc. And um, I, I think uh, it's probably best if we go straight on to John Shepard's response, because I think that he will be uh, introducing some of the uh, topics for discussion as well. So if you want to carry on, John, please do. Okay, thank you very much, Keith, uh, and thank you, Jean-Marc, for a very uh, interesting introduction, uh, in including uh, quite a few things that I didn't know. And I should say that I am not a bioenergy or biofuel policy uh, expert at all. Uh, as Keith mentioned, I'm a physicist and oceanographer with a strong interest in climate change and energy policy. But so far as this evening is concerned, I'm really just a reasonably informed and interested scientist, uh, not a specialist. And what I intend to do is to uh, mention some issues of concern uh, to me and hope that this will stimulate quite a lot of questions and discussion. Uh, like all of us, uh, I'm very worried about climate change and CO2 emissions. And I do hope that bioenergy can make a contribution to dealing with this. But as uh, Jean-Marc himself said, this is not a silver bullet uh, and it's uh, quite complicated. 
So there are three key questions to me. Uh, I mean, firstly, how much can it actually contribute to the global problem? Uh, how much land would we have to devote for it to really make such a big contribution? Uh, following on from that, what is the most appropriate niche? Uh, again, as John Mark explained, uh, there are biofuels covers a, a wide uh, range of products and uh, not all of which are highly applicable to everything. So we, we need to find out where bioenergy can make a useful contribution more so than other alternatives and we need to know where those are. And then of course the big one for anybody interested in environmental science is, is what are the adverse impacts of uh, devoting a, a lot of our land and a, a lot of our efforts to bioenergy production. So just to mention a few things that need to be uh, thought very hard about. The first one, uh, you will not be surprised to hear me say, is that biofuels are of course not zero carbon. Uh, they are hopefully low carbon, but they're definitely not carbon neutral. Uh, in fact, when you burn uh, biomass, you are putting extra CO2 into the atmosphere. It was previously sitting there sequestered in a crop or a tree. Uh, when you burn it, you put it into the atmosphere. You add to emissions. Uh, it's only low carbon or carbon neutral after the payback time to replace the biomass that you started with. And this is something that was uh, very worrying to uh, the EASAC group that Keith mentioned, to which I contributed because for some sources of biomass, and in particular standing trees, the payback time can be many decades and possibly even centuries. So such uh, types of bioenergy cannot make any meaningful contribution to, for example, meeting commitments under the, the Paris Agreement. Um, in the long term, beyond the Paris Agreement, we will still need good things and maybe biofuels and bioenergy are one of those. But for many types of biomass, the payback period is too long to be really useful for our most urgent needs. Uh, the second thing that uh, has already been mentioned is of course competition for available land. And it may well be true that uh, present uh, bioenergy is not adding significantly to demand for land. But in the future, uh, if we really try and uh, make it a big contribution from this source, there will be competition for available land. We need land for forests, for conservation purposes, and for building our carbon stock. We need forests for agriculture, for growing food, I'm sorry, land for agriculture, for growing food. Uh, and we need it potentially for producing energy, uh, as uh, many people, especially in the developing world, do uh, already. So there will be competition for available land if bioenergy becomes an important player. Secondly, uh, what is the source of the bioenergy? Uh, there are many different sources. I've mentioned trees, but there's also uh, grass like miscanthus, there's palm oil, uh, seaweed, uh, there's crop waste. All of these have almost completely different characteristics and benefits and disbenefits. So you need to consider what is the source. And then a very important point, which is often ignored, how is it dried? If you try and burn wet biomass, you will devote a very large proportion of the energy you've produced to simply evaporating the water. And this can make a very big difference to the carbon budget for biofuels. So how is it dried? Is it air dried by renewable sources, the sun and the wind? Or is it dried in a kiln? And if so, what was used to produce the heat for the kiln? Needs to be considered. And then once you've got it, what are the production and supply chain losses uh, and energy demands? As we know, quite a lot of biomass is traded internationally and 
uh, there are inevitable supply chain losses from transport, uh, from processing and so on. And all of this contributes to making it uh, less carbon, uh, less low carbon than it would otherwise be. What we need, of course, are full life cycle analyses and people are doing those. And the results that they get are quite variable and not always very comforting. Another thing to worry about, what is the water use requirement? Because all crops, all biomass requires water. And if you're requiring to irrigate, uh, uh, you may be using water that is desperately needed elsewhere for agriculture, for example. Uh, and that can be a very major constraint uh, and a problem for the uh, other aspects of the environment. Same thing applies to the nutrients. Uh, all biomass contains nutrients as well as uh, carbon and what happens to those is very important. Can they be effectively recycled? Uh, because we need to worry about the nutrient cycles, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the micronutrients, as well as the carbon. Uh, and not quite finally, but uh, the elephant in the room, of course, is the impact on biodiversity. If you want to produce biomass efficiently, uh, as in agriculture, you're likely to be driven towards monocultures and monocultures are almost inevitably bad for biodiversity. For biodiverse environment, we need heterogeneity, we need patchiness, we need variety. Uh, we do not need massive areas given over to one crop and uh, a, a not a natural crop for that part of the world in general either. So impact on biodiversity uh, alone is a very, very serious problem for large scale bioenergy production. And the final point I want to make has already been referred to, which is that the treatment in international regulations is uh, unsatisfactory. Uh, Jean-Marc said uh, not quite perfect. I'd be a bit more critical than that. I would say it's deeply unsatisfactory. Uh, and leads to perverse incentives where it is uh, possible, for example, to uh, produce wood pellets from trees in North America, ship them across the Atlantic and burn them in Europe where they will be regarded as zero carbon, which of course they're not. And unless the people at the source have done their land use accounting uh, and carbon budgeting properly, uh, it's easy for the recipient to get a, a free lunch and that cannot possibly be, be right. So we need much better regulatory mechanisms. Um, it's great to have good policies. Uh, unfortunately, a policy to me is something written on paper. What I'm interested in is really mechanisms that make things happen. And this applies not just to bioenergy and biofuels, but to climate change in general. We have far too many targets and far too few mechanisms for actually making things happen that will deliver them. So to conclude, uh, the, the answer cannot possibly be a straight good or bad for biomass or bioenergy. Uh, you need to look at precisely what is being done. So if you're pyrolyzing crop wastes in order to produce aviation fuel and making a contribution with uh, low land demand to a very intractable problem sector, then that's probably a good thing. If you're cutting standing forests to burn as a replacement for burning coal in an electricity generation, that's almost certainly not okay. Certainly without CCS, it's not okay. If you can apply carbon capture and storage and move to the biomass energy with carbon capture and storage that Jean-Marc referred to, then I think you can have a firm maybe for whether that is a sensible thing to do. But the balance of advantage and disadvantage really needs to be explored very carefully before we go headlong down that route. So some questions for you to reflect on and hopefully uh, pursue in more detail in the discussion. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much indeed, John. That uh, really, I think, um, sets the discussion off on a very good footing. I would just say that um, it's daunting. I, I think there, there are many aspects that have, have been brought in here. And also, I'm looking at questions that the audience have raised. There, there are really far more topics that I think that we can that, that I, I think we can usefully uh, or effectively deal with. But uh, and so I, th I think what I'll do is to hand over immediately to Jean Marc for his uh, um, response in in general terms or going into specific areas if you wish, and then uh, I'll try and pick up one or two of the issues that the audience have asked about um, and that arise from from uh, the discussion up to that point. So Jean-Marc, do you want to come back on any of that? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, I can hear the, these, uh, these, all these uh, remarks. Uh, we, we, we hear that um, uh, almost every day. So um, yeah, I, I noted down the, so, some points. The, the, you, you started with the um, payback time of the, of the carbon. In reality, you know well that these payback time are depending on models uh, that are really depending themselves on the hypothesis. So, of course, if you take um, uh, a tree, uh, you, you harvest this tree for whatever you use it, uh, the carbon stock is decreasing to zero, and then you plant a new seed, and then you have to wait 50 to 100 years uh, for this tree to come back at the same state, and you come with your payback time of, of 100 years. The reality is different. The, the reality, what the atmosphere sees, is different, because you will harvest, uh, not a tree, but uh, let's say a parcel, a plot, um, but in fact, if the if the rotation year is hundred years, you have ninety nine other plots that are not harvested that year that and that will continue to grow during the the, the year of harvesting of the of the plot that you harvest. So in reality, the ninety nine percent of the forest continues to grow when you harvest one percent. So in total, if you look at the carbon stock of the forest in a region or a country. Um, this is the real carbon, the, the amount of the carbon stock that, that matters, not, not just a single plot. And this makes the whole model completely different. And in Europe, um, in the last, we had forests uh, decrease in the 17th, 18th centuries, because we used a lot of wood for the for the mines and, and uh, before even the, 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 um, the oil and the coal era, we, we, we were using wood for energy a lot, too much. Uh, and the forest, uh, the forest was disappearing little, little, little by little in Europe. This is not the case at all for the moment. The forest is increasing very much. So the carbon, this, um, this, Payback time of carbon is is a kind of intellectual um, uh, tricky model, but uh, uh, I have to go off the other points because and not to spend um, uh, too much on each of them. The competition for lands, yeah, of course there is a competition for land for for everything. I mean uh, we 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 need we need. Urban areas. Uh, some people think uh, that we need more roads. We need golf. Some people think that we need more golf courses. Uh, and 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 uh, and um, and other land use uh, for for energy. And why not energy at the end of the day? Because we have to keep in mind that energy is an essential need of our society. Without heat, I mean, <laughs> how are you going to heat your homes? If the people are cold in their homes, they will certainly not be happy. If they have less electricity in the future, I can tell you that the people will be in the street. If they have less uh, shortage of fuel, uh, little by little, and if they have to, to if there's restriction for traveling, uh, that will create huge debate. So don't, any product is manufactured with energy. 
energy is replacing um, is replacing man progressively. Eh? We are not in the in the Middle Age where we were cultivating and making most of the thing with, with our end and uh, th this is over. The world works with energy. So this is an important, important aspect. So think about this, um, about using uh, dry biomass um, and how do we, wet biomass, if you burn wet biomass, definitely you have to spend the uh, energy to evaporate water, it's, it, it doesn't work, it's not efficient. So sometimes the biomass is dried to be used before combustion. Keep in mind as well that the CO2 model and the CO2 methodology of the of the commission is taking this into account. If you are using in, in, in some countries fossil fuels to dry the biomass, this is integrated in the calculation. And in fact, the the the, the are for solid biomass emission reduction of at least 70%, 80% in the future. That is a kind of a kind of guarantee that there will be uh, no extra use uh, of, of uh, fossil fuels along the supply chain. Even if you transport this um, across the world from the, from the US, as someone mentioned, uh, the transport fossil fuels that will be used is integrated in your calculation. So, <laughs> What other sectors as such as such guarantee we are importing many goods from China for the moment without any CO2 footprint almost right? we are only starting this, uh, I would say uh, so but but for bioenergy, this is this is written in the law. And, and if you are not, if the, the companies are not respecting this threshold, uh, the, this biology is not considered renewables uh, at all. So it's, it's, it's a big penalty. So they will respect the rules for sure. You mentioned um, again, impact on biodiversity and biodiversity is really essential. Uh, and, and we have danger for, for extension of, of um, and, and strong reduction of biodiversity for sure. Um, but again, the way we manage agriculture and forest needs to remain a multifunctional, uh, needs to be based on a multifunctional criteria of these, of these forests, for example. It's not that we will make natural reserves with all forests in Europe. We, we, we need to, sustainability is not only the environmental dimension, which is an important one, huh? but, but you also have people, you have a lot of people working in, this, in, this, in the forest sector, uh, especially in the rural areas, uh, and we need economic activities. If you, only the, dream, driving the world, only with one aspect, will not work and and also the, the the governments are not able to pay for natural reserves everywhere we have 16 million forest owners in europe they have to live <laughs> and if they don't live from the forest they will cut back their forest and go to something else so it's it's the world is not that simple i'm afraid um the uh, yeah I would, uh, final as with the you mentioned the regulatory aspects uh, and it's not um, it it's not uh, uh, ideal to to import pellets from the us because it's counted as zero emission the, the again the criteria in the directive are, um, one criteria is the carbon stock so the importing country of our other users in Europe, in fact, have to ensure that the carbon stock in the, con in the country of origin of the biomass is um, at least stable or increasing. So again, this is a kind of guarantee that, that, uh, that no other sectors uh, has for the moment. And you should not think that the transport of biomass is so, CO2 intensive. It, it's maybe three, five percent um, uh, CO2 emissions compared to the CO2 saved when substituting uh, fossil fuel. So, yeah, we again, it's a bit. <laughs> 
complicated, uh, but we we the, we need to go into the details. You cannot say bluntly this is bad to import to import pellets from the U.S. to replace fossil fuels in Europe. It, it's a bit it's a bit too, simp too simplistic as a, as a message. The, the, we need to to calculate this uh, this CO two footprint, and and the, the calculation shows that in with efficient biomass both in Europe and, and uh, in, in the US, in U, the US share of pellets or uh, the US imports of pellets in the whole picture is uh, between something like 2% eh, of the bioenergy. So we should not think that uh, that pellets from the US are the main the main share of biomass. Eh? Okay, so sorry to be so long <laughs> to, to answer all these questions. Do you want to come back on any of that just now, John? Uh, no, I, I, I'd be happy to hear what the audience think about it. I mean, there are quite a few things there that I could uh, get into an argument about, but let's see what the audience yeah. thinks. Well, um, I should say that, that at the moment, the audience are um, ha having an input via my uh, feed here. And, and so I can tell you that, that a number of issues have been raised that we have already dealt with. Um, and I, I don't think anyone is going into, for example, um, uh, the, a question about the water front, uh, footprint of biomass. Um, you know, what impact does uh, biomass use have on, on water use? Um, so I, I don't think that there is anything. There is one question here that I would, that's been raised by an audience member that I would like to put to Jean-Marc, because it ties in with, with something that, that I'd be interested to hear about uh, further. Um, the, the question is about uh, how much does the uh, European Union subsidize the bioenergy industry? And, and that really, to me, is, is a, and this brings in an issue that, that um, is perhaps more general, which is, do you think that the expectations that, um, that European politicians have for the contribution of biomass to the European energy transition in future is about right or is too high or is too low. In other words, I think there are very high expectations of what biomass is capable of delivering in terms of climate mitigation. And that worries me because from other things that you've said, it sounds as though the uh, the future uh, timeline of, of biomass as a contributor to heating and energy is likely to be about the same as it is just now. Important, but not growing fast like the other renewable sectors. Would that be true? Uh, yeah, ju just a you know, quick point, because you mentioned it uh, twice already. So for the water use, I mean, biomass, um for energy is i would say always a low value um, a low value biomass in reality and eh? so so irrigation which is a very costly process uh i don't even know any example of of biomass produced with irrigation uh, in the world uh, we have uh, irrigation of land in in south of Europe, but it's never for bio for biomass. It's too ex just too expensive. It's just like growing forests for for biomass production. It, it doesn't make sense. So we again, we, we I don't know where this this argument comes from, but uh, it's it's a bit strange. So for the um, the expectations, uh, the models and the the the, the, the the growth of the biomass uh, expected by the Commission, according again to the question of model, eh? but uh, are not um, amazingly high. Eh? We, are, we are thinking about by 2050, something like even less than 50% increase. Eh? It's, a, it's less, in fact, the, the, the increase of biomass in, in terms of annual growth rate is less than what we had in the last 20 years. So, <laughs> In fact, we will hardly notice <laughs> because in reality, um, in reality, because of the fact that we are using mainly residues, 
uh, we will hardly notice. You, you will notice much more the increase of the windmills in the landscape than the biomass. The biomass, honestly, you, 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 you will hardly notice the, 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 this, this, these things. For the subsidies, um, the subsidies for the moment, again, the, the, we have to look at the numbers. I don't have the, the numbers in mind, but the, but there are, there, are, um, there, there are studies on this, uh, looking at the, at the amount of subsidies that were going to different renewables and that are going to fossil fuels as well. Huh? We have to, to know that uh, directly or indirectly, uh, fossil fuels are subsidized. Huh? I don't know in the, in, in Denmark, but in some countries, the gas boilers uh, are co-financed by uh, and the condensing gas boilers and whatever <laughs> are, um, are subsidized. Eh? In in Belgium, they, they they are now because this is my country, so I know better the, the support schemes which are depending on the national level and not European level. In fact, um, they, they will they are about to decide uh, to to subsidize uh, gas gas power plants. Uh, so so is it normal? I don't know. So. You know, a lot of sectors are depending on subsidies. Uh, the, the world will be completely different if you leave it uh, completely to the market. If you leave it only to the market rules, you know, we would continue with coal for a while <laughs> uh, and with gas and with, I don't know what, but not necessarily the, 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 the good thing. So it's, if you want to orient the, the investment uh, in some cases, you need to to subsidize the what you want to to hopefully kick off the market uh, because at the end of the day, our energy needs are so huge that you cannot subsidize things for for on a large scale indefinitely. So this this doesn't no no member states can can afford this, especially now after COVID and so on. The, 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 there is no the, there is no fund. They create money, <laughs> but uh, but still there is a limit. There is a limit to that. So um, so for the moment, the bioenergy sector is mainly in the heat sector, and the heat sector. Some countries, UK, spent uh, some some money for the to to, to support uh, bio heat for for some time, but uh, now it's reduced a lot. So the main sector of the uh, of bioenergy doesn't get uh, a lot of subsidies. You have a bit more for per megawatt hour for for electricity uh, or for biofuels. The idea is to cover the costs, the, the difference, uh, the, the, the cost difference with, with fossil fuels. But the total amount, it depends. It, it, it's acceptable, but it, but it depends. It's, it's, it's subjective, of course, what is acceptable or not. It's completely subjective. Um, yeah. can, I, can I pick up another uh, point, which I think you um, mentioned a couple of times, and that's uh, on carbon capture and storage. I noted that um, you, you talked about the development of carbon capture and storage, and, and you said, don't ask me when. But then later on, you also mentioned carbon capture and storage in relation to the virtuous uh, cycle that you can get into where you remove the carbon uh, when you're uh, combusting. The, uh, the the biomass and um, can I can I just uh, bring in a, a quote from a, a UK uh, um, report on uh, um, uh, biomass in a low carbon economy, in which uh, they recommended that um, over the next decade the government should only support biomass. They shouldn't provide further support to large scale biomass power plants that are not deployed with carbon capture and storage technology. So really they were saying that unless you have plants which are in that virtuous cycle where they are actually capturing the carbon, then they should not be supported. Do you think that's right? Do you think that's right as a policy? This is already 
um, on the table huh? for the for the Renew Energy Directive, the, the third version uh, that will be decided, as you mentioned earlier, in the coming uh, one or two years. Um, there is one provision mentioning uh, that um, that uh, the power only plants uh, uh, should have um, CCS uh, should apply CCS. Um, so, so yeah, this is already. When I say I don't know when, it's true that you know it. It depends. It depends a lot on 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 technical uh, technical aspects and economic aspects, for example, and and policy aspects uh, also. But on the technical aspects, we know extremely. Fine. Technically, we can do it. There are pilot plans, different different methodologies. There are pilot plans in Sweden, in 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 the, in the UK, in even in Denmark. So um, for, for for the the, the capturing the CO two um, and storing as well, there are different possibilities uh, below the sea and yeah. Uh, whatever. I'm not an expert on this, but uh, but in Norway they have uh, they, 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 they they also have already for the moment already uh, they, they they are storing carbon uh, uh, underground. Uh, but moving from the pilot scale to the large scale. It is not uh, cannot be done overnight. I mean, you need a huge infrastructure for this. Um, for, 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 and, and yeah, this will this will really take uh, some time. Uh, depending also on you know, this is costly. This is definitely costly because it, it takes some energy to 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 to, to do it um, and. Um, and for the moment, uh, the, the, the CO2 price level are increasing, but, uh, but, but we'll give that kind of incentives. And, and on top of this, for the moment, there's no real incentive for CCS. There is an ETS price, but that doesn't compensate for, for CCS in reality. So what will be the policy, we don't know, but what is for sure is that 2050 is really short in time to reach carbon neutrality. <laughs> 2050 is, is a generation um, turning the whole energy system towards full renewables. We don't have to be naive. This will not work. I mean, uh, so, so we, will need, we will need negative emissions. We can use forest, but forest is not certainly not the silver bullet because if you and, and it's not kind of very reliable way to to go negative for carbon because the forest the forest is subject to to climate change uh, with um, insects attacked with uh, with forest fires uh, all over Europe now it's not just in South Europe uh, I'm afraid um, you have more frequent storms so this carbon storage is not secured uh, so. It will play a role, but it's it's, it's a, we we don't have to do only this. And the only way to not the only way, but the for the moment the most affordable way to capture CO two from the atmosphere is biomass. This is the you can directly capture CO two from the atmosphere, but this is. This is even much more than the Bioenergy CCS in terms of cost. This is much, much higher than the CCS, uh, biomass uh, CCS. Uh, so uh, this is certainly an option that we need to consider for sure. But this is, we hope that, uh, that by 2050, this will be developed large scale, but you know, the, 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 this is not the, what we, we say in English, the low hanging fruits. <laughs> the, the low hanging fruits are, 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 um, are, are the, the, the other possibilities that I mentioned uh, before. Well, thank you very much. Um, the, the time is moving on. And I think there is one issue that I would quite like to uh, 
uh, ask you about. And perhaps, John, if you want to come back after that, and then we'll wrap up. Um, do you think that the protection that we now have in place for European and global primary forests is adequate? Because obviously, if there is a high price being placed on timber and timber products, including uh, uh, for use uh, as biomass and bioenergy, then that will in itself threaten uh, forests. Do you think that we now have adequate protections in place for our forests and the biodiversity that goes with them? To whom do you? I, I was asking you, but John, ah, you, you, you're welcome to answer, answer as well if you wish. Yeah. Uh, the, the, yeah. If we have enough legislation to protect the forest, yeah, certainly not. I mean, uh, we 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 have in the world uh, many countries where still the forest uh, disappears. Huh? Uh, look at uh, Brazil, look at uh, some countries in Africa, where they still uh, use a lot of forest for, 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 for coffee or chocolate production. Uh, so it's, it's a disaster in some countries. So definitely, uh, we, we, we need more. Uh, we need more legislation um, at the global level to protect our forest. I'm, I'm convinced uh, by this. And in, in reality, um, the bioenergy sector lives from the forest. So the more forest we have, the better. <laughs> so it's a, it's a kind of, it's a win-win, more protection of the forest, more, um, more biomass, um, and 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 and, uh, and uh, healthy wood industry sector that will replace the fossil, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the the fossil um, carbon, uh, and 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 this 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 will work. This is this is in the same. This is going in the same direction. There is no opposition between forest protection and, and multifunctional forest, I mean, uh, and, and bioenergy, far from that. John, would you like to come back on that or any of the other issues that were debated earlier? Uh, well, I would uh, come back on one issue uh, without going into uh, much detail which is that I do think that uh, Jean-Marc's uh, critique of the payback period argument based on uh, regional accounting is really fallacious because you have to be sure that you're dealing with the right counterfactual and if you don't harvest the trees then they will continue to grow and you will have uh, carbon removal. Um, so uh, having said that I can agree with him on several things which uh, is a nice way to finish up. So I do agree that carbon dioxide removal is going to be necessary and that the easiest way to do that is indeed to grow biomass. Um, and uh, I, you know, I have quite a strong interest in the direct air capture methods and th there's no doubt that they, they work, but as he says, that's much more expensive. So I would also agree with him that the future is probably in uh, the BioS bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. Uh, essentially, if we want to do carbon dioxide removal in the near future, other than by growing trees, where I agree with him, that's an insecure store and far from ideal, uh, then biomass energy with carbon capture and storage is one of the more promising approaches. And uh, I would also agree that uh, I'm delighted to hear that the uh, European regulations are likely to insist that major biomass uh, burning plants should have CCS because I would regard that as, as essential. So my final remark I think would be on uh, subsidies because uh, we, we all know there are a lot of subsidies out there and they're mostly pretty irrational. They've just grown over time as one interest group or another has become 
dominant in the political discourse. And the proper role for subsidies is, of course, to make good things happen. And so, uh, you know, I'm all in favour of taxing things you don't want to happen, subsidising things you do want to happen. Uh, but the big question for me is whether biomass energy on a large scale is really something that we do want to happen. And I think uh, other than for biomass energy uh, with carbon capture and storage, I would say that the jury is still out and we don't know the answer because we have this evening been taking rather a European view of matters and uh, Jean-Marc has talked a lot about uh, tr uh, trees and crop wastes uh, and uh, you know f uh, sawmill wastes and so on which of course are uh, primarily uh, northern hemisphere and, and um, uh, attributes and if we look at the rest of the world of course we have to worry about people growing palm oil cutting down tr uh, nat native plantations in order to grow palm oil we have to worry about taking agricultural land to grow corn in order to produce ethanol and on a global scale these things do happen and are considerably less benign than some of the things that he has mentioned as being the primary type of bioenergy in Europe. So uh, I would argue that we should take a global view, uh, we should take a long-term view, and we should uh, insist that we engineer the economic system, the fiscal system, to deliver the results we want and not just accept what history has thrown at us. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I don't know if you want to come back at, at all on any of that, John Mark, uh, but otherwise, then... Well, I could always... <laughs> you can go on all night. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, ju just to mention then one point, this, um, this um, again, this payback uh, pay and the period, this is, is really a kind of, um, you know, infinite um, topic for discussion and you mentioned the counterfactual that if indeed if we don't harvest the forest uh, and if we leave it like this the carbon stock will increase will continue increase yeah for sure uh, this will increase but but we all know that forests are living the trees are for uh, are living organism and they have a lifetime so at some point the the trees are becoming mature and as they mature they, they capture less and less co2 so this counterfactual will work indeed for some years but then you increase your carbon stock uh, and at the same time you continue increasing fossil fuels because you haven't harvested your trees so you so you continue building wood um, houses in concrete and steel uh, and you look at your forest carbon stock growing and then if there is a fire, ah, you have you have lost everything because your stock is gone. So you, you are losing on both sides. So it, it's not that easy. And um, and, and, and indeed, we, we, it's not just the carbon stock of the forest that counts. It's also the carbon production from the forest. We, we need to have both in the balance. It's not just one or the other, it's both. Thank you. Good. Well, I, I think that brings us to that. I should just say that, that John and I share a fairly considerable background in harvesting models, uh, which we've been working on for the last at least 40 years, I think. So uh, it's uh, kind of bread and butter to us. Um, but thank you very much indeed for a really extraordinarily uh, fruitful discussion, I thought. Um, it covered, I, I was very worried, I have to say, that we would be trying to cover too much ground. And, and I think that we did cover a huge amount of ground, but I think that we did it in a way where we were able to really explore things effectively. And, and that's extremely satisfying. So thank you very much indeed for your con contribution to the debate. Uh, thank you very much to all the people who uh, have been 
joining in on this and thank you for the people who asked questions. Remember that the, um, the online version, the YouTube version will be available for some time. You can continue to uh, look at bits of the debate and comment if you wish. And um, we'll, we'll try and get back, uh, or I will try and get back on some of those. This has also been enormously helpful, I think, in relation to uh, the Vault uh, policy development process. We are in the middle of uh, developing our energy transition program and clearly uh, biomass and bioenergy is a key part of that. So uh, for that as well, thank you very much indeed. And I uh, wish you all a very good evening and thanks again. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.